His grandfather had been king, uh, his father and Ramses, but before that there had been a period of great um, turmoil in terms of the royal succession. At the beginning of the 19th dynasty, uh, when Ramses I was appointed, one of the reasons he may have been appointed king uh, was because he had both a son and a grandson, and that ensured the succession. The high mortality rate, of course, in antiquity meant that they preferred to have large families because if a third of the children die, so they're quite happy to have lots of children. The pharaoh could afford it, he had the wealth of Egypt at his command, and so they could be housed, fed, educated, and looked after. And uh, lots of children, of course, they could become part of the administration, they could earn their keep in later days in the army and so on. It is believed Ramses II fathered over 90 children. And unlike any other pharaoh, he proudly displayed them on many of his monuments. By carving them in stone, Ramses left no doubt in the minds of his subjects that the 19th dynasty would continue even after he was gone. In the Ramesseum, many of his royal offspring are prominently featured, and in later years, some of them would actually assist their father with the empire's concerns. As he got to the middle of his reign, he's a man in the prime of his years, 50, 60. Then, I think he found he needed help. Yes, he got the Grand Vizier. Yes, he got all the usual civil service bureaucracy, of course. But he needed help with royal decisions with the things that Pharaoh had to do. So you find that the eldest prince of the time was given the title Senior King's Son. And that man would help his father with what Pharaohs had to do with the royal administration. The administration of Ramses II continued for almost 67 years. And around that time, there were many developments in both Egypt and the world at large. China had developed its first dictionary, which included 40,000 characters. In both Syria and Palestine, the Iron Age began. And the Greeks invaded Troy. This was also the period in history which has often been associated with the Exodus and many feel Ramses II was in fact responsible. Name Ramses does occur in the Bible in two connections. The land had one name in the days of patriarchs. By the time Genesis was written, it was really known as the land of Ramses. So it's a, it's a name of an area in the East Delta. When you drop down to Exodus, there it's much more specific. The Hebrews had been turned to slaves, and then they escaped eventually, we're told and they started from Ramses, moved to Succoth, and then out of Egypt altogether. Scholars claim the area known as Ramses, located in the East Delta, coincides perfectly with the place mentioned on ancient monuments and inscriptions. We always have to hedge our bets when we haven't got a direct mention of the King Ramses, only of the term Ramses. But it would not be known by that name before his reign. So the present narratives cannot be earlier than his reign. So it rather suggests that Ramesses was perhaps the pharaoh of the Exodus. Ramses II's far-reaching impact while ruling as Egyptian pharaoh remains a mystery. But when it comes to Ramses II, the man, a bit more has been revealed. In 1881, there was an exciting discovery in Egypt. A cache of royal mummies was found, and Ramses II was among them. In ancient times, the mummies had been gathered by priests and placed together in one tomb to avoid their being plundered by robbers. Their relocation has been the cause of many questions. Some have suggested that it is impossible to be certain of the identities of these mummies. Yet scholars feel there is evidence that suggests that these preserved bodies were surely the powerful monarchs of Egypt's past. I'm rather skeptical that it isn't Ramesses. I think it will be Ramesses at the end of the day. But not just because it's nice to think that, but because I think they're not complete fools, the people that labeled them. They would know who they were and they took them out of their original tomb. If they changed the coffins, they'd have to label them on the spot. 
and uh, there would be some mix-ups eventually if they're in a hurry, but not the whole lot. With Ramses, we know that he had a lengthy rule, and there are very few mummies, to my knowledge, that show the age that Ramses' mummy shows. So with him, there's much less confusion than there is with some earlier mummies. We think of Ramses the Great as always being young and vigorous, always conquering foreign peoples. But what people don't realize is that Ramses died a crippled old man, undoubtedly in pain. From studying his mummy, we can see that he had arthritis. He must have limped, hobbled for the last maybe 10 years of his life. It was certainly in his 80s when he died, in his late 80s. He had a tremendous infection by the mandible, uh, which may have even caused death. He may have lived into advanced age, but it was not without its toll. Today, Ramses continues his eternal sleep in the safety of a pressurized display case in the Cairo Museum. But in ancient times, he had commissioned a grand construction as his final resting place in the Valley of the Kings. After almost 67 years, Ramses II's reign came to an end. It is believed he was somewhere in his 80s when he died. Many scholars imagine that the death of Ramses would have been met with a combination of sadness and disbelief. For many, he was the only ruler they had ever known. And during his reign, the civilization had been stable. Under Ramses II, Egypt reached, it is believed, one of its highest points insofar as material wealth, well-being, and the width of empire is concerned. Life was as good then as it was under Ramses II, but it was the end, in a way. Nothing ever achieved that again. There were brief moments when the glory came back for a while, but this was the last great efflorescence of Egyptian culture. It made a big impact, I think, because once he'd been reigning for 30 or 40 years, not many people could remember anything else. Most people alive would be born under Ramesses. And as their fathers died off and the reign went on, by the time the end of his reign, nobody had known any other king. I suspect it was probably greeted with disbelief. <laughs> people must have thought he really was going to live forever. After Ramses II's death, his 13th son, Merenneptah, inherited the throne. Experts claim he was probably between 50 and 60 years old when he began ruling the Egyptian empire. But in the end, he would not live up to the powerful legacy of his father. Merneptah doesn't reign very long. What happens after his death is very interesting. Certainly, he had children, but we still have all the rest of Ramses' sons and daughters. And there appears to have been some kind of um, strife or skirmish between Merneptah's line, which rightfully deserved to rule, and the rest of Ramses' line. And what we think is that one of Ramses' sons took over. Ramses' death marked the end of an era. The mighty empire he had successfully maintained for decades was badly shaken. Perhaps the many problems that plagued his offspring could have been avoided had the mighty pharaoh not outlived so many of them. Ramses buried at least 12 of his children before his own death. Ramses himself was buried in a tomb known as King's Valley No. 7, or KV-7. Unfortunately, much of the tomb's interior has been destroyed by flash flooding. Today, there's an ongoing excavation by a French team of archaeologists. They're searching for more information about this elusive ancient monarch. Interestingly, as the French team continues their work in KV-7, Another group of archaeologists are excitedly unearthing tomb KV-5, yet another find that directly relates to Ramses II. KV-5's existence had originally been recorded back in 1825, when an English explorer by the name of James Burton tunneled into its first chambers. This tomb, like KV-7, had been badly damaged by flooding, causing it to become packed with debris. Burton burrowed into the top of the tomb and then eventually sketched whatever he could see, which was basically the top of several rooms in the tomb. Then, 
A little more than 75 years later, the tomb had another visitor, Howard Carter. Howard Carter was the man responsible for the discovery of Tutankhamun's final resting place. He, however, decided that KV-5 was insignificant and abandoned any thoughts of further excavation there, finding it useful to him only as a dumping area for his other digs. KV-5 was basically ignored for another 85 years. Then, in 1987, a team of archaeologists working on a mapping project began to remove Carter's leftover debris, which amounted to about 12 feet of broken rock. In 1988, the archaeologists, using Burton's crawl space, went inside KV-5. Over the next six years, we began clearing out the debris from that first room and then the second small room. And uh, we discovered that the tomb actually was decorated with historically important scenes showing Ramses II presenting his deceased sons to various Egyptian gods. And as we dug deeper in the debris, we found on the floor of the chambers thousands of pieces of pottery, hundreds of pieces of jewelry, mummified remains, my gosh, you name it. It was clearly an indication that the tomb had been used, presumably for the sons of Ramses II. And as we continued over those six years, we were getting more and more names of sons. Clearly, the tomb was of greater importance than either James Burton or Howard Carter had thought it would be. In the winter season of 1994 and 1995, archaeologists launched a full-scale excavation. They dug deeply into the flood debris only to discover yet another room. This room contained 16 pillars, but a back-end doorway signaled that there was still more to come. On February 2nd, 1995, after clearing the doorway, archaeologists no longer had to rely on Burton's crawl space to move through the area they could literally exit the third chamber of 16 pillars standing up and walk into a corridor that extended 100 feet. KV-5, like so many other structures built during Ramsey's reign, was huge. It's the biggest tomb in the Valley of the Kings, perhaps the biggest in all of Egypt. It's unique in plan. Most of the tombs here in the Valley of the Kings are syringe-like corridors just extending straight into a hillside. This is a labyrinthine-like plan, like an octopus with tentacles going off in all directions. And it's the first example we have in Egyptian history of a family mausoleum. Archaeologists are certain that at least four of Ramses II's sons were entombed here, and maybe as many as 48. Experts believe the answer to the question of exactly what motivated Ramses II to construct this massive structure can be found in looking back at the length of his reign. It was a streamlined way of looking after those of your family who didn't outlive yourself. As he went reigning 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, you can understand this was a very necessary thing to do. Death was the beginning of the afterlife. So whereas they had passed on from this world, they were entering the netherworld. And in that sense, they were still propagating his family, his name. So they deserved every bit the attention that he gave them. And I, I think we really only are beginning to know what this is all about, too. I think that in future years, we'll really know much more about his family, um, thanks to this, this incredible tomb. For now, many of the secrets of Ramses II and his family are still safely hidden within the walls of the tomb. But there is hope that someday soon, the mystery of KV-5 will help explain more of the man known as Ramses the Great.